So welcome all to this uh, SIB Virtual Computational Biology Seminar Series. Today we have the pleasure to uh, host Amos Behok, Professor of Bioinformatics and Director of the Department of Human Protein Sciences of the University of Geneva. And Amos is also the head of the CALIFO group. CALIFO stands for Computer Laboratory Investigation of Proteins of Human Origin uh, of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics. So I will try to summarize Amos' life in three minutes, which would probably be difficult, so I hope I'm not going to miss any uh, main achievement in his career. Um, so until June 2009, Amos was the head of SwissProt Group, which develops uh, the SwissProt knowledge base as well as ProSite, a database of protein families and domains, as well as Enzyme, a database of information of the nomenclature of enzymes. It was also corresponding co-responsible for the de development of Expasi, the world's first website dedicated to protein molecular biology. Amos Barrock's uh, work main, uh, mainly lies in the field of protein sequences analysis and the development of databases and tools uh, uh, and software tools for this pur purpose. His uh, most important contribution is the input of human knowledge by careful manual annotation in protein-related data. His first project as a PhD student was the development of the PC gene, an MS-DOS-based software package for the analysis of protein and nucleotide sequences. While working on this, um, on this uh, software package, he started to develop an annotated protein sequence database, which became SwissProt, first released in July 1986. From 1988 onward, it has, it has been a collaborative project with the data library group of the EMBL, which has now become the EBI, and SwissProt has grown both in size and in scope, and, and in, scope and, it, and in the amount of work and people necessary to produce it. Since 2003, the SwissProt team is part of the UniProt consortium, and together with the EBI and the PI, PIR, the Proteome Information Resource, um, uh, SwissProt produces the most, the UniProt consortium, sorry, produces the world's most comprehensive protein database, UniProt KB SwissProt, as well as UniProt KB Tremble, UniREF, and UniPark. In 1998, Amos, with some colleagues in Geneva and Lausanne, has set up the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, known as the SIB, whose mission is to establish in Switzerland a center of excellence in the field of bioinformatics, with an emphasis on research, education services, and the development of databases and tools. Since 2009, in the framework of Califo Group, Amos is involved in the development of Nextprot, a resource which aims to provide life scientists with a broad spectrum of knowledge on the human proteins. Today, Amos will tell us about another resource his group has been uh, developing, which is called uh, Cellosaurus, a knowledge resource on cell lines, which attempts to describe all cell, cell lines used in biomedical research. Amos, thanks again for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diana, for this nice introduction. And as you say, in fact, I will speak about something which has nothing to do with my work, I mean, all my career on protein, and it's, I mean, a new, uh, I mean, uh, uh, passion of my, mine on cell lines. So there will be discussing bioinformatic resource on cell line, and also things which have nothing to do with bioinformatics. In fact, most of my talk has nothing to do with bioinformatics. Part of it is to warn people about cell line contamination. And the biggest part of the talk are human interest stories behind cell lines. So it will be more sociological than, in fact, bioinformatics or science. OK, let's start with cell lines. I mean, they're used all over the world by labs, academic labs, industrial labs. So, I mean, basically, most labs doing research, one day or another, are using cell lines. And people acquire them either through cell line collection, the most well-known one are ATCC, DSMZ, and so on, or more often than, I mean, than, by, than buying them, people get them from the lab next door. You know, a postdoc goes and says to the next postdoc, to the next lab, can you give me, I mean, uh, this cell line I need it for my research, and so on. So a lot of cell lines get, in fact, sent from lab to lab, from postdoc to postdoc, from main scientist to other scientists. Anyway, cell lines are everywhere, and there is a lot of different type of cell lines. Of course, there are the cancer cell lines, which many people know with ELA and others, but there are also 
a lot of transform cell line by different I mean, methods, you can transform cell line with virus, with radiation, with uh, mutagenesis, and so on. And, of course, embryonic stem cell and pluripotent cells. And, of course, also hybridomas, which are used to, in fact, make monoclonal antibodies. Anyway, a lot of different type of cell lines. And in terms of resource, what did you have until the so cell came out? Well, you have cell line catalogs, all of the cell line collection generally offers a cell line through online catalogs. You had a number of ontology, which I will describe, and many specialized databases, which either are based on cell line or report results of experiment and are linked, I mean, are linking those experiments to cell line, like ENCODE, COSMIC, and others. Anyway, up to now, there was no single resource where all this information is available. So let's start a little bit with bioinformatics, and let's start with the source of a lot of the data which is the cell line collection. Now, there is about almost 50 different entities which distribute cell lines all over the world. I mean, in Europe, US, and well, most continents except Africa. And those groups are not at all, I mean, savvy in terms of bioinformatics. They know how to ship cell lines, they know how to conserve them, they know how to distribute them, but they don't know how to basically make use of the information they have collected, and they don't know how to put it on the web. So, uh, I mean, something like a year and a half ago, I drafted five minimal requirements, which are very basic. I mean, that each cell collection should have at least one individual page for each cell line. That the page URL should be based on the catalog number, so that you can, knowing the catalog, go directly to that page. And it would be useful to have a mechanism to know what are the new cell line and what are the ones which are discontinued, because this is a work in progress. Cell line collection, every month come up with new cell line, and they discontinue some cell line for different type of reasons, one of it being cell line contamination. And also, the availability of STR profile. Here, I won't explain what STR profile. I will do so in a few slides. But anyway, it's an important item of information which allows to know which cell line is which, especially for human cell line. Now, the current situation is the following. This is just a spreadsheet. In green are compliance. You have five columns. If you can see, there is zero, I mean, green compliance over the five easy rules to basically to follow. And six even have zero compliance. Basically, they're completely red. I mean, they don't have individual page, they don't have a way of getting to their catalog, and so on. So it's changing very slowly, but it's changing a bit. And hopefully, I mean, in one or two years, there will be a little bit more green here. But you see, it's a big problem, because those groups have basically no knowledge of what it means to have unique identifier, stable identifier. They change their catalogs. They would change the URL of their page. And the same cell line suddenly is found somewhere else, and you don't even know if it's the same one or not. Anyway, let's go to things which are, in fact, more stable and which are, as bioinformatician use, those are ontology. When I started the Cellosaurus, the idea was not to create a new resource, but to use existing resource. So what was there which existed? Main one is a cell line ontology, which is a wonderful resource, almost 40,000 terms, 30,000 cell line terms. Unfortunately, in fact, it has a high degree of redundancy in the cell line terms because it creates as many, I mean, entries for cell line as there are distributors of the same cell line. So that's a little bit problematic, but it's of high quality in terms of the definition of cell type and cell category. So as an ontology of cell line types, it's perfect. As a dictionary or thesaurus of cell lines, it's neither complete nor, I mean, uh, and it's basically redundant. Now, there was another cell line ontology done in India, which, I mean, stopped, I mean, uh, it's no longer maintained, so it was a molecular connection cell line ontology, unfortunately not maintained anymore. And then you have Brenda, which does a very good job of building an ontology on every tissue, strain, and cells that they use in Brenda. And they have 2,000 cell lines in the BTO, but it's only the ones that they use inside Brenda. So yes, it's nice, but it's not really, I mean, complete. You have also EBI creating the experimental factor ontology, which has 1,300 cell lines, 
Again, it's a cell line which are used by some resource at EBI and also in ENCODE. You have the beta cell genomic ontology, only a few cell lines, and even in MESH, which has 24 cell lines in it. So that's for cell line ontology, basically. There are resources. Each of them is okay, but it's nowhere complete and for what we needed to do, far from being what we needed. Okay. Before we go to the cellulosaurus, I will make a little bit of detour through, I mean, a number of other problems with cell line. One of it is naming issues. I mean, short cell line names are a disaster. Here you have 10 different cell line names, all of it two or three characters. And in fact, those names are used by 37 different cell lines. So each of them here has at least three or four different cell lines associated. And PC3 can be a prostate carcinoma cell line, which is very well known, but it's also a lung cancer cell line. It's also a mouse cell line and so on. And the problem is, even when people propose longer names, well, then authors try to abbreviate them. So you have a cell line called FG2C3A, a derivative of FG3, FG2. That's okay to call it like this, but then people will only call it C3A. And of course, C3A is not unique. So that's a problem. So there are a few nomenclature rules, not really, I mean, a lot. There was one for insect cell line, which is quite well followed, and one for, I mean, embryonic stem cell and IPSC, which is not yet well enforced. And of course, in addition to that, the big problem is that in the literature, you have a huge number of misspelling of the cell line. So it's quite a mess to find in paper what cell line have been used. Okay, let's get to the second problem with cell line, which is the biggest one. It's a cell line contamination issue. And these are just titles of papers or, I mean, blogs, I mean, uh, on, I mean, on the last three or four years, I mean, basically, on, where people, I mean, are reporting about this problem. A lot of cell line, especially in tumor field, because it's especially true of cancer cell line, get contaminated. And in fact, estimate of the range of cancer, extent of cancer cell line contamination range from 20 to 36%. This is quite enormous. It means that one cell line out of four in a paper is not what the person think it is. So that's, I mean, quite, I mean, uh, frightening. And a lot of people are trying to help with this. One of those efforts is ICLAC, so International Cell Line Authentication Committee which was set up, I mean, a number of years ago by Amanda Cape Davis, and which has members of different cell line collections, since it's working on cell line. It tries to give good practice, I mean, information, also on how to name cell line, but also what's important, it has, in fact, a list of all known contaminated cell line. Inside, I mean, uh, if you click on it in resource, you will find it. Now, I mean, that's, I mean, quite an effort, and they try to spread the word around in conference, in different places, this problem of cell line contamination. But it was, um, I mean, the uh, best way to get rid of this problem is to test cell line, to authenticate them. And that's where those STR profile, I mean, comes up, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago. So what are STR profile? Short tandem repeats. So those are loci in the human genomes, which are both repeated, short, short bits of DNA, and quite polymorphic. And of course, you know about them because those are the ones which are used in forensic identification in paternity testing. So every uh, good American TV series has at, at one point or another, somebody is going to do some uh, DNA identification using those STR. Now, those STR can also be used to ensure the quality and integrity of human cell lines. And there is an NC standard that make use of 18 markers, so 18 of those short STR. Well, one is not really an STR, amelogenin. It's just because amelogenin gene exists in two copies, one on chromosome X and one on chromosome Y. So basically, that I mean, uh, marker is used to make sure if the gender of the cell line is correct. With some caveat, a many male cell line can lose their Y chromosome. So people have also thought, oh, this is not the right cell line. I'm supposed to have a male cell line, and I got 
I mean, only X has a male allergen in, it's not true. But the reverse is true. If you think you have a female cell line and you have a Y, you're in trouble. Now, so this is for human, and there have been no initiative to establish both panels of STR marker for mouse and dog cell lines. So this is going on. And what should people do? Well, they should basically send a cell line to companies. There's a lot of companies, including cell collection, where basically you send your cell line, they report, I mean, they give you back a report with the different alleles that they can find for each of the different STR marker. Like here, you have for CSF1PO, this cell line has, I mean, has a, a hit on 10 and 11 copies of this repeat. And so basically, then you get a report saying your cell line is identical, as an STR profile, identical to the cell line XYZ. And if it was really XYZ you were using, you're happy. Or, I mean, you get the bad news saying your cell line does not have this profile, it has a profile of another one. One of the problems with this, those companies do their job very well, but unfortunately, most of them try to keep the, data, the database of STR profiles that they use as a private thing, because the more profiles they have, the more they can test, and they don't want to send it to others, I mean, uh, competitors. Which beats a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, the principle of having the STR profile available to all so that people can compare them. Okay. Enter the cellosaurus. So as Jenna said, it's a knowledge resource on cell line. And it has a scope which covers all kinds of immortalized cell line, and including natural immortal cell line, like stem cell line, embryonic stem cell line, and also some finite life cell line when those are distributed and used by widely. Its scope in terms of species, it's vertebrate and invertebrate, insect and ticks mainly, but not plant cell lines and not primary cells, which are not cell lines, those are cell culture and so on. So it basically includes everything which is known as cell line except for plant cell lines. Now, what do you find in cellosaurus? You find a lot of things. I mean, I put it on slide in three slide, but I'm not going to go through all of it. Of course, you have the cell name and synonyms. That was the beginning of cellosaurus. The cellosaurus started as a cell thesaurus, therefore cellosaurus. But it became, I mean, a knowledge base because it became much more than just a cell line, uh, cell line names and synonyms and misspellings. But of course, the category, is it a cancer cell line, a transform, and so on. The sex of the individual from which it was established, which is very important. The species of origin, of course. I mean, it's not only human cell line. It's, as you will see, a lot of different species. For non-human cell line, what is the subspecies or breed of the animal? Known contamination and misidentification. So all of the information from ICLAC is integrated in the cellosaurus. So every known contaminated and misidentified cell line is there. Annotation of the disease of disease cell line, meaning cancer and genetic disease cell line using the NCI thesaurus, and a lot of other things. I mean, what genes are transfected, genes which are knocked out or edited, if a cell line has been selected by resistance to a compound. A lot of cell lines are tested, are challenged with, for example, I mean, uh, uh, chemotherapy drugs and so on. And then, I mean, people then develop new cell lines which are resistant to those drugs to, I mean, uh, to use them for research. The so transformant used to immortalize the cell line, monoclonal antibody target, and a lot of other things. I mean, so population doubling time and so on. And getting to the end of that list, an important thing, so STR markers. And basically, this is collected from cell line collection by asking them, nagging them. Also publication, all of the publication where cell lines, STR markers have been published, and a lot of personal communication. Basically, I go and ask everyone which says that they have their cell line authenticated to send this information, and a lot of people do. Now, it's a manually created database and links to a huge number of resources because there is also specialized resources that make use of cell line, and of course, all of the cell line collection, you see ATCC, DSMZ, Coriel, which is the biggest distributor of cell line in the world, about 30,000 different cell line, mainly for disease, genetic disease. I mean, it's a huge 
institution, Corea, like ATCC, maybe less le well known for people which are not working on genetic disease. And so where do we stand now with Celosaurus? 83,000 cell line from 564 species, but 90% are from three species, human, mouse, and rat. And 40,000 synonyms, almost, uh, well, more than 60,000 reference to 13,400 publication, and a lot of cross-reference to all of those resources I was showing on the slide before. 10,000 web links, and now there are 5,000 human cell lines with STR data. Now, where can you get it? You can browse on Expasi, where, I mean, you just, I mean, Google uh, next, uh, Cellosaurus and you will land on the page on Expasi. And of course, as bioinformatician, you may want to use it in another resource. So you can FTP it, and so it's in, available in three different formats, a structure flat file, which look a lot like, guess what, the SwissProt format. I mean, you may wonder why, I mean, uh, <laughs> and a noble format file, and what is more interesting for people working in bioinformatics, an XML file. And I would, I mean, tell people that, which are serious in using it to use the XML version of it, of course. Now, Cellosaurus usage on Expasi, I mean, it has been put on on June 2015, so two years ago, and for the first two months, it was totally private. I mean, it was, so the first part of those hits are just local hits. And then it became available, and as you see, the use is growing quite well. You see maybe two dips. You can see that Christmas has an influence on, on uh, usage of resource, I mean, uh, in the world. And so, so those are those two big dips. And what's interesting is weekends still are very important for scientists. I mean, and uh, you can see those dip every uh, week. And what's very pleasing for us is that 40% of the user are returning visitors, so that people which come to Celeros come back again, which is, and this is, those numbers are growing. And uh, I looked at it for the last month, it's more like 50% now of people are returning users. One important thing still in terms of bioinformatics is the resource identification initiatives. Now, this is an initiative which started, I think, two years ago, three years ago in US which introduced the concept of resource, research resource identifier, RRIDs. And the idea is that you should have a persistent and unique identifier for every resource that you use in experiment. Antibody, cell line, organism, and tools, software tools also, I mean. And so basically, they started this effort to try to push publishers to have authors put those RRIDs, and of course, they needed resource which can be cited and force the cell lines to use the cellosaurus as a cell line resource. And basically what you have to do in papers is put this error ID followed by a tag like AB for antibody registry, CVCL, which is a prefix of the cellosaurus accession number for cellosaurus. And basically this will allow, I mean, retrieval of the information, automatic retrieval and tracing back which is a resource which was used. And there is a portal, oops, there is a, so a resource certification initiative. You will have the URL of the portal, which just came down, uh, is missing from this uh, slide. So here is an example of, I mean, a part of a method of a paper which was published a few weeks ago in eLife. And overlined in red, you see the section of cell lines that they have indicated both in text so raw 264 cell line comes from there and put it, you know, which is their ID. And also those people have done a good job because they have authenticated their cell line by STR profiling and verified that they were also negative for mycoplasma. So that's a good thing. Okay, three slides to finish the bioinformatic part, which is just screenshot to show you a little bit of the cellulosaurus look like on Expasi when you browse to it. You have the name of cell line, you have information in red when it's problematic. You have publication, you have uh, links to the species, to the disease, to the parent cell line. Uh, you can have uh, web links, you can have information on what has been done on this cell line. For example, deep protein analysis, that it's part of uh, tumor cell panels, that it's used by ENCODE and so on. So you have a lot of information like this. And, of course, the STR profile. And here you see the markers, and you see the values for the different allele. 
And what you can see also is that, I mean, some cell line can be verified by different people, which find sometimes different results. And this is normal because cell lines are living organisms, and they can lose copies of chromosomes, or they can even acquire copies of chromosomes. And for example, this cell line on chromosome 8, on the marker D8, S1179, as you can see, has three different alleles, because normally there should be two or one. I mean, if it's homozygous at that position, it has three because probably it has a triplication of that part of chromosome 8. And here you see that on this allele, there are different results, but which more or less correlate, and that it's just that some of them have, have uh, missed the, the allele on, uh, of 11 copies on one chromosome, and the other one has missed the one of 13 copies, and so on. Anyway, STR profile, and of course, cross-reference to a lot of resources. So that's the end. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, it's not the end. I still have one slide is what can be added to Cellosaurus in terms of tool, a tool to help people to compare STR profiles. So, I mean, the bioinformatic uh, tools that will, uh, where people would enter the STR profile and compare it to what there is. And also, I mean, I'm working closely with the people from Wikidata in terms of integration of part of the Cellosaurus data into Wikidata so that it be part of the semantic web. But this, if people are interested, we can discuss in, at the question time. In terms of content, people, some people are asking for to integrate patient-derived xenograft, which are not really cell line, but close to cell line. And of course, a lot of other things can be added, like the tissue of origin, which is not yet there, info regarding the age of, of patient or animal, the virus, which are integrated in cell lines, the translocation for cancer cell line, and biosafety level. Industry is asking that this information be put in. Okay. Now, as I said, that's end of bioinformatics and contamination. And let's go to another part, which is, what is there behind those cell lines? Of course, all of you know ELA. And most of you, I guess, know about the ELA stories. It was established in 1951. It was the first immortal human cell line established at John Hopkins by the lab and by the effort of George Gay and his wife. And it's the most well-known and widely used cancer cell line. Now, it was obtained from the cervical tumor of a patient known as, named Henriette Kerlax, which was a 31-year-old patient that died in October 51. Here is a picture, a nice picture of her before she was sick. And in fact, this story, I mean, is well known because in fact, it has been, I mean, uh, described in an incredible book, which is this book, The Immortal Life on Henriette Kerlax, which I would consult to anyone to read. It's really like a detective story telling you all about the history of this cell line, how it got well known, and it's also the history of this Lax family. Now, the big problem with this cell line is the lack of consent from the family of Henrietta Lax and of by herself that her tissue would be used to make a cell line. And some people have said this is due to racism because she was black. Not at all. It was just due that in 1950, when you went to an hospital, people could, the doctors could do whatever they wanted on your samples, and nobody would have even thought of asking a patient if they were, I mean, uh, giving permission for the sample. So in fact, she didn't know that her cell line was made out of her tissue. Well, she died anyway quite quickly after the tissue was use, but her family never heard of it until uh, Rebecca Sklut, I mean, wrote her book. And it became a big issue because in 2013, the genome of ELA was sequenced by different groups, and the family was not really happy about the disclosure. And in fact, I mean, in some place, if you want to have access now to the ELA genome, you need to ask permission. Some others have put part of the ELA genome. It's almost like, you know, closing the door of the barn after the animal has got out. I mean, the part of the genome of Eli is everywhere. It has been sequenced so many times that there's nothing the family can do, unfortunately. But they're not very happy about it. They got to an agreement with NIH about that the genomic data could be used if people ask for permission. Since then, they are suing now John Hopkins. I mean, because in fact, what happens, there was also a very nice movie two months ago on ELA, which came out in the US, and it renewed the interest on ELA, and the family thought, well, maybe we should sue John Hopkins. So it's a story which, I mean, uh, is still evolving. We don't know what's going to happen 
in terms of the uh, Lax family and Hila. Now, this is a story, Hila, which is well known, but there's a lot of other stories which are less well known. Here's another story. Of course, Hila is a very aggressive cell line, and it's the one which is, in fact, contaminating a lot of other cell lines. And for the very beginning of the 1960s, I mean, from the end of 50 to the 70s, it was contaminating so many cell lines that basically a lot of the research which was done on cell line, which was supposed to be from normal human tissue, was done, in fact, on cancer cell line. And one of those cancers, I mean, normal cell line, which is not normal, but ILA, is WISH. Now, WISH was established by someone which is very well known, Leonard Eflick. And Leonard Eflick is an American scientist which discovered in 1960 that, in fact, cell line, normal cell line, are not supposed to be immortal, and that after a number of duplications, they die. This became known as the Eflick limit, and of course it took 30 to 40 years to understand that this was due to the shortening of the telomerase. But much before, it was known that you know, normal cell line would die. But at the time, he didn't know about it, so he was trying to establish a cell line. So what did he do? He tried to use a amniotic sac in which his daughter was born. And this is what he published. In conformity with the recommendation made by a committee set up to establish rules for naming cell lines, a new cell line has been named WISH for Wistar Institute, Susan Eflick. So basically, the privacy of, uh, or the consent of his daughter was not really asked. I mean, she was, but I mean, uh, this doesn't really matter because it's not anyway the genome of Susan Eflick, which is in a WISH cell line, it's ILA. But you see that at the time, I mean, people were proud of not only of saying that they have established a cell line and where it came from, they would give the full name and where of the, the individual where the cell line came from. Now, there is another story about Eflick, which is much, in fact, more, I mean, complex. And this is a story of a cell line called WRE38. So it's a finite length embryonic lung fibrous cell line. So it's a cell line which after a number of population doubling, will die out like any normal fibroblast cell line. Now, what, why did he create a cell line like this? It was at a time where people were trying to establish the first, uh, I mean, uh, the first vaccine against polio, against rubella, and other types in cell lines. And for polio, they were using monkey cell lines. Unfortunately, a lot of people found out that those monkey cell lines were infected with SV40. And it became quite scary because what could happen, maybe people could get some tumors from them and so on. So Leonard Eflick and others tried to establish cell lines from human and which should be clean. And they thought that if they took cell line from fetus, those fetus would not be sick with any disease, would not have any virus, and those could be used to grow, I mean, vaccine. So he, he developed a number of cell lines, and each of them had a number. He started with WI1, and you could think this is number 38 in Syria. In fact, he went to 27 and jumped to 38, and nobody knows why. So it was a 28 cell line he established from a female fetus. Now, this cell line is very famous. I mean, First reason is that it's a cell line which was used to produce the first rubella virus, uh, vaccine, sorry, and it's still being used for the rubella vaccine. So in fact, now the rubella vaccine is part of, I mean, I mean, either a tetra or penta vaccine with different other, I mean, vaccine, but it's the rubella part is still made using this cell line. And this is told in a story, a book from a, uh, so Meredith Wadman, which is a, a, a journalist in science, and that book is also quite nice. It just came out six months ago, and it's a detective story about vaccine, all this fight on vaccine took 30 years to, I mean, grow, I mean, and, uh, and basically what, everything which happened with this race in establishing the rubella vaccine, but other vaccine as well. So that's the so first thing, why this cell line is interesting. Second reason is that, of course, I mean, he needed a fetus to, I mean, create this cell line. 
At the time, in US, of course, abortion was not legal. You could get some features for medical, I mean, uh, where there were medical abortion, but still it was not very easy to get. So Leonard Eflick had a collaboration with Swedish, I mean, doctors. And basically, the features which was used to produce a cell line was from a woman which had a number of child, children. She was, as it says here, married to an alcoholic and she didn't want another baby, so she got an abortion, which was legal in Sweden, but difficult to get, so she got it when she was four months pregnant. And she didn't know that her fetus was used to derive a cell line. Of course, nobody asked her at the time, but she knew after, some 10 or 15 years later, what happened is when companies started selling the rubella vaccine, they wanted to make sure that there was no, I mean, genetic problems with the cell line, and of course, you couldn't sequence at the time, so they asked back to the Swedish doctors saying, can we have the record of this woman to know if, I mean, she, there is no uh, mental problem or no genetic problem in her family and so on. And they went back to her and she was quite angry about it. And in fact, when one man contacted her in 2013, she basically told her that, this was not something which should have been done, that this was all done without her permission, and she is quite, uh, uh, well, angry, and rightly angry. And in fact, we don't know who she is, and that's, I mean, quite normal, because one man which contacted her promised that her name would not be known and kept secret. But you have somewhere in Sweden a very angry woman, and she's rightly angry because all of this has been done without her permission. Now, that's not all for WI38. So it's used, as I said, for vaccine with also another, I mean, finite uh, cell line from a fetus in US from the Medical Research Council, MRC5. And it's a big issue for every right wing, li right lifers in US in other countries, which says that, I mean, vaccine should not be uh, built out of what they call baby parts. So baby are not spare parts, so they say that because those cell lines come from a fetus, there is part of a fetus which was aborted inside the vaccine, so children should not be vaccinated with such, I mean, uh, vaccine made out of fetal cell line. So it went to the Vatican also, and which made a report, I mean, uh, the Pontificia Academia, I mean, which was led at the time by uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, which became Pope after, and he basically said, yes, it's okay to vaccinate with those vaccines, but he urged people to make life difficult for the pharmaceutical industry. So since then, there are fights all over. Every time some companies come up with, uh, I mean, their yearly, I mean, board meetings, you have people with placards saying, you know, stop making a, a vaccine out of dead baby and so on. So companies are moving out of making vaccine with human cell lines. They're using Vero cell line for monkeys. They're using chicken cell lines and so on. And now, I mean, the pro-lifers have started being virulent, not against the US, but against China, because in fact, the Chinese have created a cell line called Valvax2, and they want to use for vaccine. And of course, you have things like scientists in China create new vaccine using body parts from nine aborted babies. I mean, okay. So you see, our WI38 still has, I mean, uh, is a cell line which is as a story. Now there is a fourth part to this story. So Aflick developed WI38 at the Vistar Institute where he was working with an NIH grant, but he got into a fight with the director of uh, Vistar and he moved to California. Okay, stand forward. But he took with him a fridge with, I mean, uh, liquid nitrogen, and he drove all over the US with all of the little vials of WI38. And then nobody really complained, because what happened is after he would continue, whenever somebody wanted the cell line, he would ship aliquot of the cell line, and he would just ask for a nominal fee for shipping. So normal pro procedures, so nobody cared. But in 1974, he thought he should create a company. He created a company called Cell Associate, and then he went to companies producing vaccine and asked them for licensing fee. Now, 
NIH suddenly started to be interested and they started an investigation which basically destroyed the career of Eflick. He had to resign from where he was. He was not in Stanford anymore, but I don't remember where he was. But anyway, he had to resign. And it took seven years of legislation and it ended with an end of court, uh, I mean, uh, uh, decision. And basically, I mean, for a long time, his career was destroyed. And it's only now that he's doing a lot of interviews. He's 88. And he's seen by a lot of people as a precursor of the relationship between biotech industry and scientists at universities. Because those rules about making patents from, I mean, products which are at university started in 1980s. I mean, when the, at Stanford with the first patents for, I mean, genetic uh, production of insulin and so on. But in 74, it was seen more as something that a scientist should never do, is create a company and make money out of it. It was seen as, he was evil. Now he's seen more by his, uh, as a precursor of, uh, I mean, of things which have happened since. Okay, another story. MSC F7, most well-known breast cancer cell line, 1971, stands for Michigan Cancer Foundation seven tries, so they tried with six other patients, didn't work, and they managed with seven one. And the seven one, we know who is a donor because she's she was sorry a sister in a convent in Michigan. So Ellen Marion was known as Sister Catherine Frances. And she had cancer in 1962. They tried to cure her cancer. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. And when she was dying, her doctor asked if he could use her cell line. And she was happy to do so. And the congregation was not only happy to allow this, but also to publicize the fact that those cell lines come from her. So this is a case where, in fact, the donor accepted. And in the website of the congregation, you will find the story of this nun. And the doctor said that maybe one of the reasons that he managed to grow those cell lines and not the others before is because she prayed every day. I'll let you decide if it's true or not. Now, another uh, cancer cell line was developed in the 19, late 70s by a group uh, in California by Dr. David Gold and his, uh, his team. And what happened is that they filled for a patent. So that was a patent on a cell line, which was quite rare at the time to patent a cell line. But the problem is John Moore didn't know, the guy from which the cell line was established, didn't know about it. And so he didn't know that there was a cell line, and he didn't know that it was patented. So when he learned about it, he sued the University of California. And basically, it was a big discussion, and the courts decided that basically he could not get money from the University of California, because he had consented to allow Gold to perform research on sample of his spleen after surgery, and that part of this research could be a cell line, and once you had a cell line, you could patent it. But what was very important is that Gold was, in fact, uh, hit a little bit on the fingers by, uh, I mean, by the judge, which said that he had breached his fiduciary duty. He should have informed John Moore of what was done with his samples. So, John Moore could not have money from this cell line, but he should have been informed at every step of what was done. Now, what's interesting is, who is this guy, John Moore? So he died in 2001, and you can see that this guy has a really interesting life because he was a surveying engineer in, on an Alaska oil pipeline, an alcoholist counselor, a photographer, a warm, he ran a warm farm. I don't know if anybody running a warm farm, but anyway. He sold seafood. He was a seltzer and beer distributor. And then he was in sale and marketing for an internet company. So really, it's somebody which had a lot of different skills. And I think it's a quite a very American life story of a self-made man which went from one job to another one. And his daughter, I mean, said that he was very adamant that the fact that patients should know what happening to their body or to their body part. Now, another story, which is old, but which is also interesting, is the Kenyan Burkitt cell line. So in 1947, an Hungarian scientist left Hungary because that was a time where it became, I mean, a communist country. He fled from Hungary, went to Sweden, and with his wife, they opened the Tumor Biology Center at Karolinska Institute. And they worked on the connection between EBV and Burkitt lymphoma. 
EBV had been discovered, I mean, a number of years before, Berkeley lymphoma also, but suddenly it became known that EBV could be a cause of Burkitt lymphoma. So they used biopsies that were sent from hospitals in Kenya to establish cell lines from Burkitt lymphoma. And a lot of you which have worked on cell lines will know about DODI. It's used everywhere as a type of Burkitt lymphoma cell line. It's an example of a cell line which is used everywhere, I mean, uh, for studying Burkitt. Uh, yeah, uh, for Burkitt lymphoma. But the thing is, what they did is they named the cell line with the first name of the patient. Okay, that's already discutable. I mean, it would be not, I mean, uh, allowed not to do this. But what's worse is that the papers mention the last names. So here I've, I mean, taken away the last names. In fact, just to tell you a little story, when I started Celosaurus, I put, you know, this cell line comes from the cells of a patient named Dodi such and such. And uh, a scientist, I mean, uh, Amanda Cape Davis, which ran ICLAC, told me, you shouldn't put this. Those people have not given permission for it. And I said, yes, but I can find it on, uh, you know, by just Googling and finding those papers. And she said, yes, but don't spread more this information that what it should be. As those people never gave their permission, uh, we should not put their names in any... Uh, uh, public database or resource and so on. So that's why you see here some black, I mean, uh, box. And it shows, I mean, that at the time people didn't care of saying the full name, where they lived, in which cities they lived, and put the pictures. And sometimes you have even pictures of the, the family and so on. So uh, that was deemed quite normal at the time. What time is it? Uh, okay. Another, a few other short stories, much shorter on, I mean, a number of other, I mean, cell lines. So you see this cell line with the paper, that's the title of a paper, I mean, from groups in Germany. You see that the first author doesn't have an institute on it. It just says Apparat Rottenbach. And if you go at the end of the paper, it says that basically the first author is the person from whom the cell line was established. So basically, that's the only known, I think, paper I could find which describes a cell line and adds, uh, I mean, uh, added the name of the person as an author and even the first author on the paper. So that's, I mean, uh, quite, I mean, uh, an interesting story. Now, here are two small stories which are quite sad, and then I will go to less sad stories. They are about pediatric cell lines, so unfortunately cancer in small children. This is a cell line from a neuroblastoma, which was established in 2006, so neuroblastoma NB 2006, from a small girl which died when she was nine. And her father asked to name the cell line, and he was quite angry with, I mean, the disease, I mean, which killed his daughter. And so he basically names a cell line, and that cell line, you could guess what FU stands for, and basically, I mean, uh, I mean he wrote in a, in a blog exactly what it stands for, but I mean, it's probably not something that will be published in any scientific journals. The reason for why this cell line is called FU NB 2006. Now, another sad story, but which is also shows more what people can do once they get out of this horrible trauma of losing a child. It's this small girl, uh, Claire Wetzel McKenna, which died seven years old from another very rare cancer, diffuse intrinsic pointing glioma. And what her uh, parents did, they created a foundation to help, I mean, studying this disease and basically, I mean, to try to, I mean, advance on the research on this cancer, which is quite rare. And so really, in fact, very active. They raised over $1 million over the last five years. And uh, basically, I contacted him and I said, I mean, is it okay that I put in the cell service that these cell lines come from your daughter and that I point to your site and to your foundation? And he says, yes. And you can tell the story of the foundation because the more people know about the foundation and if they're going to, you know, give money for research for this cancer, the better it is. So this is a... Uh, an example where, in fact, the privacy issue is less important for a family than 
making sure that this disease can be fought, I mean, uh, in uh, the most efficient way. Now, yes, there is still another story, which, uh, a uh, sad story, sorry, I forgot about that one, so sorry, still two, one sad story before going to more. This is also on a rare disease, on, it's a nose cancer, sinonasal undifferentiated carcinoma, and I mean, one of the person which had, was diagnosed with this cancer was at the time a young uh, medical student, first year medical student in Tulane University in New Orleans. And basically, when he knew about it and knew that this cancer is fatal in 98 to 99% of the case, he had to decide, do he continue his study or do something completely for the next few years before he dies? And in fact, he decided that he wanted to continue his study, but also try to do something to fight against this cancer. So he convinced a very well-known hematologist, Tiller, Tiller Curiel, to work in his lab to establish a cell line. Here is a nice uh, drawing of Tiller. And while doing his studies, so he managed to pass every year his exam, doing all his radiation treatments. He worked during the night in the lab. It was really frustrating because he didn't manage first, and he did manage to get a cell culture in 2004. He needed money to get this running, so Curiel, which is an ultramarathon racer, what he did is basically he created something called the Bones for Life, and he set up a world record by taking a basketball and running and dribbling a basketball for 108 miles for 24 hours. So that's quite an achievement. So he's in the Guinness Book of Records, this guy, for having done this to get money for this cell line. Now, to get, I mean, of, I mean unfortunately, I mean, uh, Andy Martin died in 2004, but the story continues is that in 2005, Hurricane Katrina destroyed most of the infrastructure, research infrastructure of Tulane University, including, I mean, the labs where the cell line was. But Curiel managed to save his cell line, and they published, there was a journal, art, a newspaper article where he basically managed to get it. Now you could say, where is his cell line? Now that's where the story is not finished. I tried to contact Curiel, he doesn't want to answer me. I'm going to nag him until I get to know what happened to this cell line because it was never published. So the last part, thing you can find is in 2010, seven years ago, it was said that he was working on it, but I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know what's happening with the cell line. Does it exist? Was it lost or not? But it's an interesting story. Okay, so not tragic stories. Here is two examples, and I will go fast on it. One is a melanoma cell line established by a group of Ruth Alaban, and she's a very well-known uh, Yale University melanoma researcher. She developed a number of melanoma cell line, one of it from a patient, whose name is known because he wrote a book called Cancer Gifts, where basically he explained his fight against melanoma. And basically he says, for example, I was forever proud to see UF in scientific presentation of melanoma researcher. It stood for my cell line, U for Yale University, and F, H, E, F for Efronan. And when Yale legal official told me UF was a too descriptive identifier, and said it had to be changed to something less decipherable, give me a break, basically, He's proud of it. He doesn't want people to change the cell name. He basically makes it known that it is his cell line. So it's an interesting guy because he studied journalism and then he worked for US Senate. And in 1970, he was one of the guys which managed to, to push President Carter to sign the creation of the US Department of Education. I thought the Department of Education was something, a ministry which existed for years and years in US, but no. It was not a separate minister. There was no secretary of state for education. So Carter signed the law to get, uh, and he was one of the person fighting for it. Then he worked in the context of horticultural trade. He was uh, director of those trade association. And in 2007, for and the next three years, he had this horrible fight against melanoma, radiation, surgery, uh, interleukin treatment, interferon. And he was one of the first people to be saved by experimental adoptive T-cell uh, therapy. So in fact, he's, he was lucky to be one of the first. And now, together with his husband, 
he basically says stopped working in uh, the field of of, uh, of uh, articulatory trade and so there is journalist and they have I mean a bed and breakfast inn in Vermont and uh, the White Horse Inn and you all I mean <laughs> welcome to go there when he so basically he I mean I contacted him I asked him about his story and he he was very happy if we make some advertisement for his <laughs> bed and breakfast in Vermont. <laughs> Last story about cancer cell line, uh, the John Hopkins Cordoma line, seven. Cordoma is also a very rare cancer at the skull base or spine. And GSC7, it was one of the first lines for this disease. Established by a group, I mean, of Alfredo Kinons Inojosa, and he's a famous brain surgeon. And is an example of the stupidity of well, there's a lot of stupidity in Trump, I mean, uh, uh, policy, but of immigration policy, because you can see that in 87, he basically was one of the people which jumped the border, got caught, got sent back to Mexico, tried again, and basically, it's a type of success story, American success story. He basically didn't know anything, didn't know any word of English, had no money, but he managed to rise up in the, culturally and being a doctor and a very well-known uh, neurosurgeon. So he was, his group established his saline, and it's from a woman called Susan Garbett. She's, I mean, a uh, native of Baltimore. She's a retired kindergarten teacher, which is now living in Florida. She started writing her first book on Alzheimer because her father had Alzheimer, so she wrote a book. And then, after a fight against Cordoma, she wrote another book, I mean, uh, which is called Confronting Cordoma Cancer. And she has also on Facebook, she explains, I mean, or she went to the lab and looked at her cell line and so on. So basically, because of that, I could put two and two together. I know that it was her cell line, contacted her, and she was happy to share the story and that it'd be known that GS7 is from her, I mean, uh, cordoma cells. Last two slides, nothing to do with cancers. This is uh, induced pluripotent stem cell, and it's for, from Coriel, the Coriel, uh, I mean, libraries of cell lines. They have also cell lines with GM and a number, and it comes from someone which some of you have maybe heard of, a guy called Craig Venter, and he's so publicity shy that he don't only, he announced it on the Craig Venter uh, Institute that there was a cell line, an apparently healthy IPSC cell line, which was available from his fibroblast. So, Obviously, I mean, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't want it to be, I mean, secret that this cell line is from his fibroblast. And another guy which is not shy either, and that all of you know as bioinformatician, and which has two cell lines developed from his tissue, this is George Church, who is a very well-known U.S. geneticist, was active in human genome, E. coli genome, is not uh, trying to recreate a woolly mammoth, and to synthesize the human genome, I mean, basically, you hear about him every, I would say, month with another thing. And he created something called the Personal Genome Project, that some of you know, where people basically put their information on their genome, and even, like him, their health record. So, of course, you can find his genome and cell lines from his uh, genome. And here is another cryptic cell line, the last one. And this is not a human one. It's just to say that it's not only human cell lines which can be established from individuals which we know who they are. Clint is a chimp which was sequenced and which was on the first page of Nature a number of years ago. Unfortunately, he died just after the genome was published, but there are time to create cell lines. So Clint is dead, long live Clint. And there are four cell lines which has been established from his tissue. So I don't think anybody asked for his consent, but anyway, I mean, maybe they did. We will never know about it. So that is the end of those uh, human interest story. And at the end, I want to thank for all of this. Uh, also, Elizabeth Gasteiger, because she implemented Cellosaurus on Expasi. And I got to, in my boat, I mean, uh, in Geneva, working, Elizabeth working for the web team of the CIB, and Alain Gatto for the Califo group and was developed a tool which allows the OBO and XML version to be generated from the flat file. But also to thank 500, more than 500 scientists which answer nagging emails to get information on their cell lines. 
Amanda Cape Davis, which I said, which is Secretary General of ICLAC, she had a lot of suggestions for Celosaurus, and she led me to a number of those stories. And those people which, I mean, uh, agreed that their story be told here, Susan Garbett, Robert Fonen, and David Wetzel's uh, father of uh, Christine Wetzel. So with this, this is the end, and I thank you for your attention. So thank you.